Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I didn't know if I have to say good afternoon or good evening because time is a little bit mixing in my head right now. But uh, I believe it was three in the morning, so good morning, everybody. Um, we are opening this uh, workshop on uh, deterrence and military victory. Um, we'll speak about the subject matter uh, later on. But at first, I would like to announce that this, uh, this workshop is uh, dedicated as a memorial uh, to the memory of uh, um, Eyal Lagunis. Eyal uh, was a very special person, which you'll uh, learn, learn about him in a moment. Eyal is, that's the picture of Eyal. And Eyal was a man of values, uh, the salt of this earth, and definitely the salt of Israel. He was described by the Israel Defense Ministry, Moshe Elon, as the ultimate intelligence officer, no lesser than that. During his military service, Eyal served as an intelligence officer in the paratroopers unit and in Sayyid Matkal. Sayyid Matkal, I'm sure you're familiar with, is the main Israel special unit uh, of uh, IDF. Uh, and he was involved in numerous uh, secret operations. Eyal managed uh, to combine his creativity uh, in his intelligence work. And for intelligence officer, combining creativity with, uh, with intelligence is maybe the key factor for success. After Eyal was released from the, uh, from the army, he began to study architecture. He did not plan to return to the army, but uh, Again, the current uh, defense minister, Moshe Elon, who at, uh, at that time was the commander of Seyat Makkar, had other plans for Eyal. Elon did not give, him, give up until uh, Eyal agreed to return to the army and serve in Seyat Makkar as the intelligence officer of the special unit. During this period of service, Eyal was involved in complex operations. Some of them we know, some of them we don't know. Maybe one of the most known operations that Eyal was the architect of this operation was the targeted killing against uh, Khalil al-Wazir, Abu Jihad, <coughs> Arafat deputy, and uh, who at that time was the commander of the military wing of uh, Fatah. <coughs> the operation revealed once again, and every, anybody who was involved in this operation can vouch for it, it showed how brilliant Eyal is. Uh, it showed his uh, special values and uh, infinite uh, uh, deduction. On May 1995, only at the age of 37 years old, Eyal died due to a sudden heart attack. On his gravestone, it's written, a man, an intelligence officer, an architect. We are proud to have this scholarship at uh, ICT and IDC. This is a scholarship fund in his memory. And uh, we are very proud to collaborate with his family on that matter. <coughs> the annual scholarship promotes research in counterterrorism and homeland security by the IDC students and also by IDF officers. Eyal was the son of Raya and Chaim, both of whom we lost recently, actually in the last year, and the beloved brother of On, On is here, sitting with us, Oz and Adil. Yehezi Chobarov. May he rest in peace. We are now moving into a subject matter which in my view is one of the most uh, critical, complex, and challenging issue, and this is deterrence in counterterrorism. Counterterrorism as a whole, I think uh, everybody in the room knows from his own point of view, counterterrorism is, is, is a huge challenge uh, for the international community, uh, very difficult to, uh, um, to uh, uh, bring the, uh, uh, the solutions that we're looking for um, and very complex subject matter. 
There are many, many uh, questions, dilemmas, challenges that has to do with counterterrorism, but I think one of the most difficult and interesting challenges is the question of deterrence. Deterrence of terrorists, deterrence of terrorism as a whole. Deterrence used to be uh, a problematic subject matter way before um, the phenomenon of modern terrorism has become uh, um, so uh, concrete. The uh, deterrence of states, it's also a subject matter which was researched. Uh, doctrines have been written on that. I'm talking about uh, Cold War time, det conventional deterrence, non-conventional deterrence, and so on and so forth. Also, when we talk about deterrence of non-state actors, a lot of literature has been written, a lot of literature is being written on that subject, and I think that still we scholars, experts, didn't crack the uh, essence of, uh, of deterrence. Uh, most of the people, uh, everybody in the people, uh, from the people in the panel, uh, actually wrote about that, researched that, that phenomenon, and contributed to the understanding of this phenomenon, but still, a lot need to be done in this respect. The difficulty in deterring uh, terrorism is based on a uh, few aspects which are so common to deterrence and typical to deterrence. First, I would mention the question of uh, rationality. I would argue that one cannot deter an entity, an organization, a person who is irrational. So rationality is preconditioned to deterrence. And um, as such, there is a big question, are terrorists rational actors? Which terrorists are rational actors? Is there a difference between the perpetrators, the leadership, different types of organizations, and so on and so forth? Deterrence is a factor within the world of psychological warfare. Deterrence is a world of images are based on world of images. In deterrence, you are trying to send a concrete message to the uh, opponent, to the library, that if he will do something or refrain from doing something that you want him to do or you want him to refrain from doing, then you would impose a price on him which would be bigger than any benefit that he might get from this specific step. For that, you need different type of manipulations, psychological manipulation, kinetic manipulations, and so on and so forth. Just in order to make it clear to him that price would be greater than benefit. This is, of course, based on the world view of, uh, uh, of the, pub of the uh, opponent, based on his culture, his uh, experience, um, Another difficulty that needs to be mentioned that in many cases, in most cases, it's much more difficult to correct wrong image that you already have in the eyes of the opponent than stabilizing a, a new image or from, from scratch. There are different types of deterrence. We are talking about deterrence of terrorism as if it's uh, one uh, whole but practically, there is offensive deterrence. There is defensive deterrence. For example, defensive deterrence would be a situation in which a person uh, or, or a facility would like to deter the terrorists from getting into this specific facility. So I would argue that, in a way, entrance control is uh, one tool of deterrence. And when we are talking about uh, the world of terrorism, I would argue that there is different type of deterrence that need to be taken for different types of actors. To deter a lone wolf, if possible, it's different than deterring a loose network. To deter a loose network is different than deterring a hierarchical terrorist organization. To deter a hierarchical terrorist organization, I would argue, is different than deterrence of what I refer to as hybrid terrorist organization i.e. a terrorist organization which controls territory, controls population, 
has a lot to lose, involved in pseudo-legitimate activity, DAO activity, political activity. This is a different ballgame. Deter such an organization, it's totally different than deterring the own wolf or the uh, sleeper cell or whatever. So I hope that I uh, uh, made it clear how uh, complicated the subject matter of deterrence in general and deterrence of terrorists in particular is. And just in order to uh, pave the way uh, to the experts that we have here today uh, and to explain that in order to try to understand this complex phenomenon, you need the best scholars in the world, the best experts in the world, to discuss that matter. And I do believe that we, at least in that, in that mission, succeeded to bring them over to this workshop today. I will introduce uh, each one of our speakers just before I will call them to uh, the podium. But the order of things that I would like to uh, share with you right now is that we will see uh, two short movies, video clips actually, movies, that would, uh, that would explain the complexity of deterrence. And then I would call the first speaker, which is me, to, uh, to give you a lecture. This was not a lecture. This was a welcoming uh, uh, note. And, uh, and then I would ask uh, my colleagues to come one uh, by uh, one after the other. Uh, to share their views with us. And then, before we open the discussion, I would ask uh, my mentor, uh, Professor Aurel Merari, who's sitting here with us, to be the responder for uh, all of those uh, uh, things that you would hear uh, from the speakers today. So let's start, uh, first of all, with, uh, with the uh, two video clips. The first video clip that, uh, that we chose was to uh, <coughs> refer to the concept of uh, the rationality of the opponent. I will refer to that in my lecture as well. But are they rational? Aren't they rational? Do they have a different type of rationality? I think that this very short video clip will explain the difficulty. <laughs> تجيده كل من في هذه الأرض يجيده الشيوخ يجيده المجاهدون ويجيده الأطفال لذلك شكلوا دروعا بشرية من النساء والأطفال والشيوخ والمجاهدين ليتحدوا بذلك آلة القصف الصهيونية وكأنهم يقولون للعدو الصهيوني إننا نحرص على الموت كما تحرصون على الحياة it's a good question, is it just propaganda, is it true or not, but if you really desire death more than your open, your, your rivalry desire uh, life, can a person like that, can a group like that be deterred at all? I leave it as an open question. And then I want to show you um, another video clip, a totally different video clip, that was taken from a movie. Uh, series actually that you probably will recognize and it show is speaking about the concept of proportionality and the concept of proportionality has a lot to do with the issue of deterrence I refer to that in my presentation as well but look and listen <laughs> not the same thing <laughs> you know what I was just thinking what's that this is different coffee than we usually have. Keep your seats. Good morning, Mr. President. What do we got? Three retaliatory strike scenarios. When are they operational? At the President's command. No prep time. We're there. All three scenarios are comprehensive. Meet the obligations of proportional response and pose minimum risk to American personnel and assets. Scenario one, or Pericles one, to use his code name, sir. What is the is virtue of a proportional response? I'm sorry? What is the virtue of a proportional response? Why is it good? They hit an airplane, so we hit a transmitter, right? That's a proportional response. Sir, in the case of Pericles They hit a barracks, we hit two transmitters. That's roughly it, yes, sir. This is what we do. I mean, this is what we do. Yes, sir, it's what we do. It's what we've always done. Well, if it's what we do, if it's what we've always done, don't they know we're going to do it? Sir, if you 
Turn your attention to Pericles 1. I have turned my attention to Pericles 1. It's two ammo dumps, an abandoned railroad bridge, and a Syrian intelligence agency. Those are four highly rated targets, sir. But they know we're going to do that. They know we're going to do that. Those areas have been abandoned for three days now. We know that from the satellite, right? We have the intelligence. Sir. They did that, so we did this. It's the cost of doing business. It's been factored in, right? Mr. President. Am I right, or am I missing something here? No, sir, you're right, sir. Then I ask again, what is the virtue of a proportional response? <clears throat> it isn't virtuous, Mr. President. It's all there is, sir. It is not all there is, sir. Admiral Fitzgerald. Excuse me, Leo. Uh, pardon me, Mr. President. Just what else is it? The disproportional response. Let the word ring forth from this time and this place, gentlemen. You kill an American, any American, we don't come back with a proportional response. We come back with total disaster. Mr. President, are you suggesting we carpet bomb Damascus? I am suggesting, General, that you and Admiral Fitzwallis and Secretary Hutchinson and the rest of the national security team take the next 60 minutes and put together an American response scenario that doesn't make me think we are just docking somebody's damn allowance. <laughs> Well, we couldn't say it better. <laughs> and this actually uh, uh, leads me directly to, to the presentation that I wanted to share with you. Um, one word of warning. I would refer to uh, the previous uh, uh, movie and the previous type of terrorist organization, i.e., a hybrid terrorist organization, a terrorist organization which controls territory, controls population, and have a lot of things that might be lost as an outcome of this uh, uh, um, conflict. And uh, if, if we need to make it clear, I refer to an organization like Hamas, Hezbollah, and yes, I would argue that ISIS is a hybrid terrorist organization along those same lines and we would see more of those organizations popping up in the future. In the past, when we were speaking about this phenomenon of hybrid terrorist organization, the many scholars and decision makers would even raise uh, a question, is this a terrorist organization whatsoever? My recent book, a little bit PR doesn't hurt because it's also uh, uh, being transmitted live, <laughs> global alert. One of the uh, reviewers, that read my book, some of the reviewers gave me good grades, one of them gave me very bad grade, and the main criticism was that this book takes uh, as a, a case study Hamas, and Hamas, quote, unquote, is a questionable terrorist organization. It's not questionable whatsoever. It's a different terrorist organization. It's a hybrid terrorist organization. But we would see much more terrorist organizations start to act like Hamas. When they start to control territory, control population, needs to give the services to the public, being involved in politics, and so on and so forth. It's no more an Israeli problem, those hybrid terrorist organization phenomena. I refer to that. I refer to the war that was conducted, uh, or the operation that was conducted in Gaza recently. I, the first slide I showed in the plenary session on, on Sunday, very briefly, I will go over it for those who didn't see it. Um, I would argue that the evolution of modern warfare, especially when it deals uh, with uh, uh, the rivalry between a state and a non-state actor, it started from, from a symmetric war, a war between a state and another state. Uh, the battlefield was the military battlefield, still is the military battlefield, and you uh, win and lose this war by, by your capability to defeat the operational capability of the other side, by your ability to defeat and to neutralize the fire uh, power of the other side, not necessarily destroy it, but defeat uh, until a level which uh, the other side cannot uh, use it anymore effectively. Um, we saw in the midst of the 20th century the rise of uh, the modern asymmetric warfare, and, uh, and here we are talking about a conflict between a state and a non-state actor, a state and organization, or a state and a terrorist organization. And we finding ourselves dealing with another dimension of conflict. And the other dimension is the psychological uh, uh, communication uh, battlefield. And here each side 
is trying to defeat the motivation of the other side to keep on fighting, i.e., by the way, defeating motivation to keep on fighting, meaning deterrence. Each side is trying to deter the other side not to keep on fighting, although he still has operational capability to keep on fighting. The third dimension that I would argue we saw the rise of this dimension in the last decade or so, it's the legal dimension. Here, each side is trying to defeat not just the capability to keep on fighting, not just the motivation to keep on fighting, but now they are trying to defeat the legality or the legitimacy of keep on fighting and to defeat them. Now, the real challenge when we are talking about modern warfare, when we are talking about a warfare between a state and a hybrid terrorist organization, is that you need to win in those three dimensions simultaneously. You cannot afford to win only in one dimension. If you win in the military battlefield, but you would lose the public opinion, you would lose the international support. If you would win the hearts and minds of the international masses, but you would lose in the ICC, you lost the whole war. And you would not be surprised that the outcome of what I'm saying here is being carefully taken by the planners of modern warfare against terrorists. Today, you would not see just the military general sitting and deciding what would be the next operation, how it will be taken, what the measures, what the tactics, what the strategy. No, he will be accompanied by a legal advisor who will tell him what is right and what is wrong from the legal point of view, and probably also with a psychological expert that will tell, you what, tell him what is the implications of what he's doing and what he can expect as an outcome of that, and how maybe he can elaborate his kinetic activity in order to uh, achieve the goals that he wants to. I would like to uh, take uh, a protective edge operation in Gaza as an example to explain what I call the deterrence legitimacy paradox. Take uh, two uh, uh, ranges, the uh, range of uh, restraint uh, in, in the military activity and less restraint. Now, I'm not saying restraint and non-restraint, because non-restraint, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a war crime, it's illegal, this is definitely out of the question. But within the spectrum of what is just and what is rightful and what is legitimate at times of war between a state and a non-state actor by the international convention, by inter international humanitarian law, Geneva Conventions and so on and so forth, in this spectrum, still, there are, you can be more restrained or less restrained. So that's the range I would like to refer to. The other range is the timeline. You can have an operation which will be rapid operation or a slow operation. And of course, you can decide how rapid it is altogether. I would like, in general, to argue, <coughs> and there are exceptions, but in general I would like to argue that as much as you are less restrained, and more rapid in your activity, you have better chances to reach high level of deterrence vis-a-vis -vis this specific terrorist organization. You know what? I think it's true in most cases, but this by itself, this statement, worse, uh, uh, worse uh, analysis, because it's different, I would argue, from organization to organization, one situation to another situation, but this is a general statement. As slower you are in your military activity, and more restrained, probably you would have less deterrence or low, uh, low deterrence. When you are looking about the second dimension, the legitimacy, international legitimacy, it's exactly an opposite situation. As more restrained you are, and more uh, rapid you are in ending this conflict, the, uh, the uh, cost that you would pay in the international arena would be much less, the legitimacy would be much higher. And as this, uh, uh, um, this uh, 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 um, activity that you do is less restrained, you will be much more criticized in the international arena. When we go back to protective edge operation, such an operation can end by one of the two outcomes. Either a decisive victory or a certain type of a settlement. Decisive victory could be a decisive victory in which the terrorist organization, i.e. Hamas, defeats Israel 
I'm talking about theoretically. Or Israel defeats Hamas, that's a decisive victory. Or you reach some kind of a settlement that I would differ between three types of settlements. Four settlements, com compromise settlement, and surrender settlement. Meaning, in four settlement, the state is forcing the, uh, um, the outcome of the settlement on the terrorist organization. They dictate the settlement. In surrender settlement, the terrorist organization dictate the uh, uh, outcome of the, of the settlement to the state. Compromise is when which si each side is uh, contributing something to that. You will not be surprised that, first of all, that you might be surprised. First of all, from an Israeli point of view, decisive victory was out of the equation because the Israeli government told the IDF, we don't want a decisive victory on Hamas. Because decisive victory means reoccupying Gaza Strip, because their political, strategical consideration, this was out of the question. When protective education started, IDF knew that it would be end with a settlement. This settlement, other settlement, compromise, surrender, but it would not be a decisive victory because this was not the goal of IDF. So you would not be surprised to see that Israel tried to reach a, 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 a settlement. Well, in Hamas also knew it. It's not only of idea. course, of course. It was not a secret. It was publicly uh, stated. So Israel tried to reach uh, a, 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 a settlement in which we dictate the, uh, the content of the settlement. And Hamas wanted to have a surrender settlement uh, uh, in this uh, situation. Now, from an Israeli perspective, you can understand the complexity when you understand that we are not talking about bipolar, be uh, 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 institutional uh, or entity uh, uh, situation. It's not Israel versus Hamas, because we have so many other villains sitting around us and just learning the lesson learned from this conflict. I'm talking about Palestinian Jihad. I'm talking about uh, uh, Jabhat al-Nusra. I'm talking about Hezbollah. I definitely talk about the main enemy, Iran. And whatever will be the outcome of this conflict, limited conflict in Gaza, will immediately have an impact on the image of deterrence of Israel on all of those other actors at the same time. By the way, the Iron Dome, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is only intensified this paradox. Because when you have an effective defensive technology like the Iron Dome, and by that you are managing to lower the number of casualties that you have, the international community would not accept a very high level of casualties among the other side, especially not collateral damage. <coughs> we would, God forbid, had hundreds and thousands of Israelis dead, well, I think that even the international community, which is not that supportive to Israel, would understand a less restrained activity from the side of Israel. When you're talking about this scale of restraint, you can actually divide it into a few stairs, few levels of restraint. Could be very much restrained, down there, or almost uh, 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 going to the edge of what the international humanitarian law permits you to do, you can have level. So you can decide that through the timeline, you are hiring, you, you, are, you make your uh, um, military activity less and less restrained. At first, you start very restrained. It doesn't work. OK, so we'll move on to level one. It doesn't work, later on we would move to level B, and so on and so forth. So what you see here, you would gain, uh, in, in a very slow manner, more deterrence as time uh, uh, flies. But as I said before, simultaneously you would lose your legitimacy as time flies. So there will be, and now I'm talking from an Israeli perspective, I, I believe that when you talk about superpower it's totally different, but from an Israeli perspective, there will be a certain point of time, which uh, maybe we can even point out when it will happen, that the legitimacy of what you do would be so low that you will find yourself in pressure, international pressure, 
to end, to stop wherever you are, all the losses you have, all the gains you have, that's it. This would be, under these circumstances, uh, after a long period of time, and not with a lot of success of gaining determinants. As a state, you can have a different strategy and have faster and higher stairs of, uh, of uh, um, moving on in the uh, uh, scale of restraint. Here, you would gain deterrence more rapidly, but you would lose your legitimacy more rapidly, and you will be stopped faster than it used to be before. If, if in the previous slide, Israel would have been stopped by the international community under international community pressure after 50 days of operation, here we are talking about 25 days of operation. But there is a totally opposite type of doctrine, if you wish. And this is to start with the less legitimate, the less but still legitimate restraint activity. And as time flies and, and the international pressure goes up, you can lower down your uh, uh, restraint uh, uh, steps and, and be more and more restrained in this uh, respect. You would expect that in this situation as an outcome of, and I'm saying less restraint, there is one conclusion to that. More collateral damage on the other side. Not illegal collateral damage, but more collateral damage on the other side when you have an opponent which is assimilated in the civilian society and take it as a strategy to drag you to cause collateral damage. Then you would be stopped quite fast, quite rapidly, after what, five, ten days, with more deterrent factor capability. So I have other things to say. I'll stop here. It's not, uh, uh, it's not solved. It's only just to intrigue you to, uh, uh, to really uh, understand the complexity of the subject matter that we are talking in one niche, which is deterring hybrid terrorist organization. I'm sure that my colleagues would refer to other niches as well, uh, uh, deterring other types of, uh, of terrorists altogether. And I would like to call uh, uh, the first, uh, uh, the, the next speaker, uh, Professor Martha Crenshaw. I, uh, I dismissed myself from giving you the whole biography of uh, Professor Crenshaw because she, you know, when you're flying from abroad to ICT uh, conference, and I think that Brian Jenkins can vouch for it. Uh, you start to work as if it's a sweatshop. If you are in the level of uh, Martha Crenshaw, Brian Jenkins, Alex Schmidt, and the rest of, uh, of the panel here. We don't let them off the hook. We want them in this panel and the other panel and so on and so forth because we want to give the advantage to, uh, to our uh, uh, participants uh, to get more and more information from those, uh, from those people. So, that's the, maybe the bad side of, of things, but the good side is that I don't need to go over the whole biography of Martha. I would say one thing about Martha. Martha is really uh, the pillar of the discipline when I was uh, uh, a student of Professor Merari, and I remember very uh, concretely, I asked him, who are the people which I need to cling to, which I need to read, which maybe I, I need to meet if I travel to the United States? Uh, the first two names that, uh, that you mentioned was Professor Martha Crenshaw and Professor Brian Jenkins. Uh, and thank you for coming, Martha. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. And uh, I will talk about deterrence. I'll probably have a bit more of an American perspective on deterrence. So uh, let me first uh, talk about deterrence and what I see as deterrence. 
And second, I'll talk some about the obstacles to effective deterrence. Boaz has already introduced that subject by pointing to the rate of court question or the rationality of the opponent. So let me first say that um, I tend to be a strict constructionist when it comes to defining deterrence. And uh, I think of deterrence in a very uh, strict and classic sense, in the sort of Thomas Schelling sense, that we're talking about either threatening to retaliate if the opponent crosses a red line, or deterrence by denial, meaning that we make it so hard for the adversary that they change their minds. So I agree completely with Boaz that we're talking about altering the strategic thinking of an adversary. We're not concerned with their capabilities when it comes to deterrence so much as their motivation. We want them to think twice about attacking us and to be, in effect, intimidated, sufficiently intimidated that they will not uh, attack. Uh, what it means, of course, is that we're not trying to change their hostility toward us necessarily. We're not trying to resolve a conflict necessarily. We're simply trying to keep them from attacking us. And what it means, perhaps, is that we can live with them. We can live with them as an adversary. We're not going to try to destroy them as long as they don't try to attack us. We simply want them to stop. Now, you might all sit out here and say, we're good students of international relations. Uh, we agree with you completely. That makes all the sense of the world. This is the original conception. However, in the US government, and I think also in the Israeli government, uh, there tends to be a stretching of the concept of deterrence to include things that I think of as not deterrence. And let me start simply with an American example, because I know it uh, best. And I'll involve some of my uh, collaborators here in this. But uh, in 2001, uh, the Defense uh, Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, uh, decided to ask a group of academics and experts whether or not terrorism could be deterred. And of course, they're thinking terrorism by non-state actors such as Al-Qaeda, because it's the immediate aftermath of 9-1-1. So they posed this question to at least two different groups. And one of those groups was a panel convened by the National Academies of Science, on which I served. And another group, if I recall correctly, and Brian can help me with this, uh, was composed of the RAND Corporation and the Institute for Defense Analysis. So they posed us the question, can you deter terrorists? Well, my panel, which I'm happy to say included Tom Schelling himself, said, no, no, you really can't. This, it's really too hard. Don't go in that direction. However, the RAND panel was cleverer by far than we were. And they said, let us redefine the question. Can you influence a terrorist adversary? <laughs> that was so clever. And they said, well, yes, you can influence a terrorist adversary, yes. So that was very good. I also heard, and this was probably apocryphal, that uh, the dark head of DARPA said, I don't want a long report on this. I just want yes or no. Can you deter them? <laughs> We're typical. I, well, I won't make any aspersions about DARPA. <laughs> they wanted a very short answer here. So uh, as, as things went on in the United States, uh, Strategic Command uh, in the Air Force became interested in this subject because deterrence being most of the time an Air Force responsibility in the US, uh, they got into this and they began to hold conferences and meetings. Uh, I, I would attend and initially I was really quite puzzled walking into the room. They kept talking about DVO. What on earth now? DVO. What on earth could it be? Well, it meant deterring violent <laughs> extremist organizations, DVO. <laughs> so I figured this one out. Well, then all they began to get criticized so much for saying that you could deter them that they went back to influence. And so you began to go to conferences, and it was about IVO. <laughs> so we were going to influencing violent extremist organizations. But the bottom line is that it was a stretching of the concept of deterrence. And I never understood why there was this fascination with it having to be deterrence. Why couldn't we talk about simply influence or affecting the motivation of these organizations? So I think that we should stick to a very narrow conception of what is deterrence. And what I'm particularly interested in is deterrence by threats of retaliation. Uh, the other variant, of course, being deterrence by denial. And I think Iron Dome is a very good example of that. So uh, in Israel in particular, but also among some experts in the US, uh, there's grown to be an interest in what's called cumulative deterrence. Cumulative deterrence. And this is the idea that your adversary attacks, you swap them down. They attack again, you swap them down again, and they attack again, and you swap them down again. 
And eventually they might get the point that's not going to get them anywhere. I don't really think of that as classic deterrence. I think it as perhaps it's a strategy of tit for tat uh, in a Robert Axelrod sense of responding to your adversary in a similar manner. But I think that it is stretching it too far to call it deterrence. And therefore, I was really very interested to see that the IDF has a new strategy, which has just been announced, what, about a month ago. And uh, if anybody knows whether there's an English translation of the full text, I would be interested in knowing. I couldn't find one. So I'm reduced to relying on English language summaries of the Hebrew document, which was apparently published for the first time, which is interesting in and of itself. We need a translation to Hebrew. <laughs> there needs to be two translations of this document. But it apparently refers to cumulative deterrence, and it refers to a different conception of victory, which apparently, again, having not read the original document, which is really very interesting, and it's a new development in, in this sort of debate. But as I say, I don't think that cumulative deterrence is truly deterrence, and I don't understand why we should try to call it deterrence rather than something like a tit for tat strategy. Uh, it leads into issues of proportionality. Every time you swap the enemy down, you have to swap harder every time, as we saw in the clip from West Wing that uh, Boesh uh, showed us. So we're still struggling over the concept of what is deterrence and is deterrence an appropriate strategy for dealing primarily with non-state actors. And I won't even use the term terrorist organization. So let me turn now to barriers to effective deterrence, of which there are, unfortunately, many. One of which is a question of rationality that Boaz demonstrated, and there are two others, that, and there are many others, but there are only two that I'll talk about now for the sake of brevity. Uh, one is a problem of attribution, and other, the other is a problem of des designing a threat that is both credible and painful to the adversary. And Boaz also entered into this discussion. What, what can you threaten the adversary with? So the question of attribution. I think possibly this might have typically been a bit easier for Israel than it's been for the United States, because Hamas and Hezbollah or have been more known actors, better intelligence on them, more uh, identifiable as actors. And I think attribution perhaps was not as serious a problem, but I think it is growing in difficulty as more and more actors enter the scene, uh, as there are more competitors to these two organizations, and as we see general uh, uncertainty and diffusion of threats spreading throughout the region. So I think attribution is going to continue to be uh, a very serious problem. Uh, for the United States, we saw it uh, demonstrated, I think, most vividly in the case of uh, recently Ambassador Stevens in Libya, uh, calls on the part of Congress and other interest groups to retaliate against whoever uh, murdered the ambassador, but nobody really knowing who did it, which faction among a variety of factions was responsible for it. Uh, there are many other similar cases in which it was really very difficult for U.S. authorities to establish who did it in a way that was believable, that is, could you demonstrate uh, with some accuracy that everybody around the world would believe in terms of legitimacy at home and abroad, that you knew that it was this particular actor, and to establish that in a timely way. Because I think that if you're going, if you have to retaliate, and if you have to retaliate, that means that deterrence has failed. If you can't do so quickly, I think it loses its legitimacy and loses its value in terms of affecting the calculus <coughs> of the enemy. So I think that if you've got to execute a threat, I think it has to be timely. Not everybody agrees with me about that, so I'm happy to accept uh, argument. And I think in cases where there might be state involvement uh, in an act of terrorism, all these difficulties are compounded because the consequences of misattribution are even higher than with uh, a non-state actor, particularly should it be uh, Iran, particularly now uh, in the case of Iran. And the reason this is important is, of course, that how can you issue a credible threat to retaliate if they know on the other side that you're not going to be able to figure out who did it in a timely way? You're not going to be able to retaliate. Then there's the issue of designing a threat that has these two dimensions. One, you're willing and able to execute that threat because you have to communicate that to the adversary and they have to believe it. And designing such a threat that is sufficiently painful that it will deter the adversary. 
This leads you into all sorts of issues of legitimacy. So, for example, the West Wing clip, the U.S. carpet bombs Damascus. The U.S. would never do that. They might be tempted to. That might be effective deterrence. Uh, they're never going to do that. So there are limits to which a democracy simply cannot go, and Boaz has discussed those uh, in some detail. So your challenge, the challenger, your adversary, knows this full well. Hamas knows this when it places rockets in schools and hospitals and in civilian neighborhoods. They know this full well. In fact, one of the purposes of terrorism is to provoke. So it's not at all clear that your adversary is in the least discouraged by the fact that you might retaliate. They might want you to retaliate. So where does deterrence get you there? They're hoping, hoping that you will engage in a disproportionate response. This is the essence of terrorism. So deterrence, they're going to be your threat. They're just sitting there trying to up the ante on their side so that you will retaliate against them because this is very helpful to them in a, a variety of ways, one of which is mobilizing popular support among their constituents. So they may be trying to provoke excess uh, on your end. They're pleased if you retaliate. They, how, do you, how do you escape that kind of logic? So in the end, I think I have to conclude that I don't think that deterrence is really a particularly viable strategy for dealing with the types of organizations that we're all confronting now. We'll put ISIS at the, at the top of that particular uh, list. Uh, I, I don't quite see how it would work with ISIS for us to say, okay, here's a red line, uh, don't cross it. Uh, if you cross it, we'll do, and of course that leaves open the question of should you specify the threat? I think the first day of this conference we heard some argument that uh, Israel should do a better job of specifying the threat to Hezbollah should they cross certain red lines. Uh, you run into the problem of do they know where the red line is? On the other hand, if they know where the red line is, does that give them a really nice line to cross? It tells them exactly what they should be doing. So uh, I'm going to conclude on a sort of pessimistic note that I, I really don't think that deterrence in the classic sense, and I think we should stick to the classic sense, is, is the way to think about dealing with terrorism, and I think we need to find a better way to think about it. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. The, the next uh, speaker uh, will be uh, uh, Brian Jenkins. Again, no need uh, for introduction. Um, to those uh, few that came from Mars and doesn't know uh, Brian, I would say uh, Brian is currently the uh, senior advisor to the president uh, of uh, RAND Corporation, has previously served as the chair of uh, political science department at RAND, and really one of the pillars in the, of the field. Thank you very much. While we're, while we're setting this up, um, I wanted to um, note that last year uh, at this conference we had a workshop on, uh, on deterrence uh, chaired by uh, Ariel Morari. Uh, it was an excellent uh, an excellent series of presentations, and there we are. Good, thank you. Um, and so here we are again this year, and, and, and what we're really saying here is that this, this is a continuing effort, if, if, if not a struggle, to, to address how we apply some of these strategic con concepts, or listening to Martha, whether indeed we should try to apply uh, uh, certain concepts to, uh, to combating terrorism. Um, the, uh, you know, it's interesting is people think, by the way, that deterrence uh, during the Cold War was this, uh, was this doctrine that somehow was quickly formulated near the beginning and that it lasted throughout the Cold War. And in fact, that is not the accurate history even of deterrence during the Cold War. Um, there was a constant, a constant redefinition and re-examination of, of, of how that would be applied, whether there should be uh, measures of deter 
deterrence that would be short of uh, all-out mutual destruction? Uh, what would be the circumstances? Uh, so that was on the move, too. So, so we ought not to hold up the Cold War model, in my view, as, as, as somehow uh, written in, 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 in stone. The, the difference uh, in, in, in my presentation in this workshop versus, uh, uh, Boas mentioned they keep us working hard here, and it's a lot of fun, I don't, it's not a complaint. But the, the difference in between my comments here and, and my comments on the, on the uh, uh, couple of days ago is that in that case, um, I'm really reporting on detailed research that I had done and reporting results. And here, uh, you will see from the slides in my comments that I am thinking out loud asking as many questions as I am answering, in fact, I think asking more questions, and, and, and really revealing that this is, still, this is still a work in progress, an intellectual work in progress, this is still a struggle uh, in, in that sense. I'd like to follow on to, to, to Boaz's uh, 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 presentation. Um, in in, uh, in his, his earlier comments and, and, and these charts and do make one difference between what Martha <coughs> was talking about and what Boaz was talking about. And that is there was one striking difference in the Cold War. We were, we were talking about deterring an action or actions that would be of enormous consequence, indeed, that would immediately be existential. We were talking about deterring the Soviet use of nuclear weapons. Now, there's no, there's no gray areas, there's no, uh, in, in that particular action, it's not a matter of, you know, are there, are there 3,000 rockets from Hamas or something like that? We're talking about a nuclear weapon. That's nuclear war. And so that changes the, 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 the context entirely. Or, even at a convention level, we're talking about deterring a Soviet invasion of Western Europe. Soviet tank divisions pouring through the Fulda Gap, crossing Germany again. That is existential, and, and, and it makes a difference. When we get into uh, the charts that, 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 that Boaz presented, and this is not a criticism of the chart. This is, this is I thought, a, a, an intriguing display of, of, of some of the, the dilemmas we face. But obviously, in, in that chart, we saw in between these lines, there are circles of settlements, and where exactly those are we don't know, and it depends on this, and it depends on that. So we, we lack, in a sense, the, the clarity that we had uh, for the kinds of events we're talking about in the Cold War. And in a sense, the title of my, my comments, we're talking about deterrence in gray areas. That is where it's not obviously uh, existential, and should that, should that um, in last year's uh, 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 presentation, I talked about, you know, our record of deterrence. And we did try to deter terrorists, specific tactics, use of terrorist tactics in general. Um, and if we look at that over the last 40 years, it, it had a murky record in terms of how could we, how could we understand this. Uh, uh, we, we found that uh, the use of some terrorist tactics declined, uh, possibly because of deterrence, but also there were other many other factors involved to explain that. Uh, we noted that terrorists did not do some of the things we were really concerned about, but then we can't really say they didn't do those things because they were deterred. We we're not certain that they really ever imagined that they wanted to do those things anyway. So uh, it, 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 we don't have a clear record on this. Now, with, with that, let me, let me come to some, some observations and, and, and questions. 
Um, in today's world, the use of military force under any circumstances is legally recognized, but increasingly rejected. It is just military force, war, no longer has the legitimacy. It may be legal, but it's not legitimate in the eyes of, 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 of many. Uh, the second contextual comment is that Western nations are increasingly sensitive to any casualties at all. Friendly casualties, enemy casualties, certainly collateral uh, 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 casualties. Um, the third aspect is that as a result of this, we see either long, the prospect of long, costly wars without clear-cut victories as we engage the United States and, and Afghanistan and, and, uh, and one, one can say Iraq, or alternatively, repeated military engagements without, without outcomes or as in the military operations by Israel and Gaza, so we, we have episodic warfare. Um, the cost engaged in those, and it, it, it becomes itself um, uh, a, a deterrence to us on our side. We're just not interested in those kinds of uh, kinds of con uh, um, contests, and and they bring about the possibility of all sorts of potential political crises hostage situations, uh, um, public backlash, and so avoidance becomes a kind of self, uh, uh, a form of self-deterrence. Um, so then we ask the question, does that mean that our non-state adversaries, our hybrid adversaries, our rogue states, can in fact deter us more easily than we can deter them? Question. Um, what are the Israeli operations in Gaza? Um, deterrence is based upon an ability and promise, I mean both capabilities and intentions, to inflict a severe cost. So severe that we're up at the top corner of, of, of Boaz's chart. Um, but the problem we have, as demonstrated in the Gaza operation, is that Hamas, in order to counter that, uh, formulates a strategy, as we saw in the, little, uh, in the little clip, of deliberately exposing its population to risk, uh, which will result in casualties, which will be seen as disproportionate, and therefore lead to, to, to criticism. So they countered us here. Now, one has to point out in that, that, that that kind of strategy depends on a calculation that Israel is not going to be ruthless. And I'm not arguing that it should be. One would not make that calculation in dealing with Assad and Syria. Because there, in fact, uh, it was demonstrable in Hama, in a place that there would be a ruthless response. Um, do assertions, uh, Boaz mentioned the, 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 the hybrid uh, the hybrid adversary, uh, that assert a kind of statehood, pseudo-statehood, quasi-statehood, um, does that really change the, the rules of engagement and the concept of deterrence itself? There's no question. The mere fact of elections in, 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 a, in a world that places a value on, uh, on democracy gives them a measure of political legitimacy. Brought further by a former PhD student of mine, uh, Tore Bjergo, in a little volume, uh, Strategies for Preventing Terrorism, for which I wrote the foreword. And he developed nine elements for preventing uh, the crime of uh, terrorism, which uh, you find here. Uh, deterrence through the threat of punishment or reprisals <coughs> is part of uh, that package. But uh, as has been pointed out by the speakers uh, today, uh, there is a place for deterrence, of course, but it cannot be uh, the whole or the main answer uh, to uh, terrorism. 
When I uh, conceptualized a plan for this proposed handbook on uh, terrorism, my first attempt is uh, to bring in uh, the lessons that can be learned from uh, the counterinsurgency literature, crime prevention literature, and uh, existing literature. And I think the one pool of literature that is underexploited is the reflections of terrorists themselves in their internal papers, also in their memoirs, if they ever live long enough to write them. Let's hope they can't. Uh, these documents show us where their bottlenecks are, are, where their weaknesses are. And unfortunately, it takes often too long a time for these uh, documents, big boxes of the treasure files or from about uh, to reach uh, the analyst to exploit. But that is certainly the first part of uh, the handbook. Then, uh, complicated as the radicalization uh, process is, I think we have to look at how radicalization uh, takes place in uh, yeah. different contexts, and I have listed them here in the third part. Then uh, the whole uh, area gets a bit uh, more complex and diverse in uh, part uh, three. Relatively much has been uh, said about prevention of uh, nuclear terrorism, uh, because this is a big uh, source of concern but it has often been in fact uh, free uh, science because uh, the threats coming from uh, trafficking in nuclear <coughs> materials, uh, chemical and biological materials as well, are not really well uh, documented. I've kept uh, chronologies of all four uh, weapons of mass destruction these days, even uh, cooking pots are called weapons of mass destruction, totally uh, irresponsible application of the term. But anyway, uh, the data in this area, because there are also so many hoaxes and uh, disinformation out there, they are difficult to collect. But uh, it's one of the more developed prevention uh, aspects, uh, though even there uh, the data are we have a lot on prevention of suicide terrorism, but I think that is one of the success stories here in uh, Israel. But uh, depending on the sort of borders you have, uh, it is uh, not everywhere applicable. <laughs> and finally, uh, I think the prevention of vigilantism in response to terrorist campaign, the polarization of society, the paybacks and all that, that has also to be included in uh, such a uh, thing. Uh, about 12 years ago, uh, Matthew Mahan wrote, uh, prevention as a science and a skill is still its infancy. With additional research, analysis, and practice, maturity will come. Well, that is now more than 14 years after 9-11, and uh, some 10 years after he wrote that. We mentioned is one of those concepts, uh, like community policing, everybody likes it in principle, but very few people uh, do something thoroughly about it. And frankly, I've tried to uh, get uh, some funding for all the chapter writers in the book because I'm not writing all the 35 chapters myself, uh, or the 5,000 per chapter writer. And within the UN and outside the UN, I've still not been able to find uh, the funding uh, for uh, such a handbook while all sorts of other projects uh, have been more successful in finding funding, which I find uh, disappointing, but I will uh, still continue because it's the one book I want to finish. Actually, the other book I have in the making. I just completed a book on uh, the terrorist on trial, which will come out in a month's uh, time, where I argue that the only court that matters in the terrorist trials is the court of public opinion. You have to convince that one. But the other book I want to write before I die is called uh, 2050. Before you retire. The world in 2050 as it could be if we all did our best. That's the utopia. And the world as it will be if we model on as uh, we do. So that's the other one I want to write. Uh, 2050 is, I'll be 170 years old by then. Maybe has to be around. I hope so. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, <laughs> Professor Schmidt. Uh, now we will have another person who needs no introduction, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Price. Lieutenant Colonel uh, Price is the director of uh, the Combating Terrorism Center, as well as assistant professor in the Department of Social Science at the United States Military Academy at the West Point. He has other uh, things to read, but since we already mentioned that in other panels, we'll stick to that. Please, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I'm short like Martha. Maybe I should have had a step stool like you did yesterday. I want to thank uh, Dr. Gnor for, for inviting me to this great conference and uh, uh, for being on such a, an amazing panel. If you can permit a, uh, an American analogy here, it's like being on the, a panel of it's the Mount Rushmore of, of folks from terrorism studies. And so my colleague, Kent Solheim, and I were wondering how in the heck we'll be lucky enough to get on this, on this panel. Now, Kent has great hair, so that's probably, that explains that, but I'm still trying to figure out why I'm here. Um, also, I want to thank Arava for all the legwork he did in putting this together, and I, and I really appreciate it. And then for both uh, Lieutenant Carl Solheim and I, I just have to put out a quick disclaimer. Uh, what you're about to hear today is my, my opinions and, and Kent's opinions. Uh, they don't reflect those of uh, the U.S. Military Academy, U.S. Army, or DOD. Um, today, I'm going to take a little different um, take uh, on looking at deterrence, and I'd like to put up some empirical analysis on some of the research that I've done on leadership decapitation and how it affects terrorist group mortality. And hopefully at the end, we'll have another little bite at the big complex animal that is deterrence. So there are a number of benefits for utilizing leadership decapitation as a counterterrorism tool. And I'm not going to go into the details of, of each of these benefits, but what, one thing that you will find in, in almost every uh, study on leadership decapitation and its effectiveness, they will always come up with the notion that it's successful at deterring future leaders from taking over, and it's also successful in deterring future terrorist activity. And so we're, we're going to take a look at some of that here. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go into the other side of the camp, which talks about some of the, you know, the the cons, if you will, of leadership decapitation. Just want to acknowledge that uh, there are some valid criticisms out there, you know, against using uh, leadership decapitation. So, in my dissertation and in some published work that I had a couple years ago, uh, I evaluated the effectiveness of leadership decap uh, by looking at terrorist group mortality. And so, the scope of my study looked at uh, leadership decapitation as defined as when you kill or capture. So I included both of those measures uh, of the top leader. And so this isn't, I'm not talking about you know, second and third uh, level leaders, this is the top leader. And I created a uh, original data set that com was comprised of 207 groups, and the date range was from 1970 to 2008, so a, a pretty fair amount of folks. And I also limited my study to terrorist groups that had conducted at least four terrorist attacks and had at least one fatality. So I wanted them to make sure that they had popped on the state's radar screen. Uh, ultimately, it was 204 observations of leadership decapitation, as well as 95 other uh, means by which there is leadership turnover within uh, these groups, whether they step down from power, whether they get thrown out of the group, whether they die of natural causes, uh, or other uh, random uh, events like car crashes and, and that sort of thing. I use Cox proportional hazards, and so you don't have to be a, an expert in those. I'll kind of help walk through that. But my main question was, uh, how does leadership decapitation affect the group's uh, mortality rate? <laughs> so here's just some of the, the raw data uh, uh, up here. Again, groups from 1970 to 2008, at least four attacks, one casualty, and you can see the breakdown, the two by two. Uh, a lot of groups, uh, as I had hypothesized, had ended after they had been uh, decapitated. And this is uh, kind of a graph graphical depiction of my findings uh, on one slide. And what it is, it covers the effect of leadership decapitation over time on the hazard ratio of terrorist group survival. And so for those that are unfamiliar with how to interpret these cost proportional hazard maps, um, if you take a look at the, the x-axis is the years of existence for the group, the y-axis is actually the hazard ratio. And what I'd like you to take a look at is this middle curve here. 
Uh, the top and bottom dotted line curves with a 95% confidence interval, but this is, is the main one that I looked at. And so the other thing to look at on this uh, graph is this horizontal line at one. How to interpret this is if the curve is above one, that means that uh, the group is more likely to, to end or die uh, than when it's decapitated than not. If it's below one, it means the group is actually more resilient to organizational death after they suffer a leadership decapitation event. And down here, when it is actually touching zero, uh, the model is unable to determine whether or not the group is either increasing or decreasing in its mortality rate. And so the important kind of takeaway from here is the, it's a good news story when it comes to leadership decapitation. Uh, if you're able to decapitate a group in the first year of its existence, uh, you're more than 8.7 8 times as likely for that group to end after suffering that leadership decapitation event than a non-decapitated group. The bad news, though, is that uh, it decreases over time. And so the effects of decapitation on its mortality rate decrease over time. So if, at the 10-year point, uh, your effect is kind of halved. And then at the 20-year point, the model, if you include the 95% confidence interval, is unable to determine whether or not uh, that group is either increasing or decreasing its mortality. So in other words, uh, uh, for organizations like Al-Qaeda, when we killed bin Laden, you know, maybe there was not a lot of naive folks in Israel or, or the United States, but uh, some folks felt that, okay, we killed bin Laden, uh, the group's going to su suddenly catastrophically collapse. And, and that just is not the case. And so as groups get older, they become uh, more resilient to organizational death. So what does this have to do with deterrence? Um, I just want to show you some, some of those numbers to kind of lead into what I'm going to talk about next, which is some of the uh, anecdotal evidence, and in some cases which you probably are more familiar with than I am in this. But here are three leaders that were uh, uh, decapitated, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the movement for the emancipation of the Niger Delta uh, organization with the acronym of MEND. Uh, the gentleman in the top left is uh, Bakran, uh, iconic leader of LTTE in, in the Sri Lankan uh, conflict. And that group, after he was killed in 2009, uh, has suffered tremendously and is, is definitely on the decline. But I don't necessarily would attribute that necessarily just to uh, Prabhakaran's death. There was uh, obviously a lot of uh, uh, military operations and activity that, that led to the group's demise. And uh, there's probably, I don't know if there's anyone in here that knows the, the group's leadership thereafter, but they're definitely not as iconic or uh, as powerful as Prabhakaran. If you were looking for a test case for an organization, uh, going back to what Boaz was talking before about hierarchical groups versus decentralized groups, this is definitely one of those hierarchical organizations. He was a cult of personality, and yet the group is still, you know, limped on after, after his death. So there really wasn't a lot of deterrence there. The second case here uh, is Hamas, and obviously there's people in here that know way more about uh, this group than, than I do. Uh, but this is, I would argue, kind of what you are going to expect uh, from leadership decapitation against uh, groups today to include the hybrid groups that, that Boaz talked about earlier. Uh, Sheikh Yassin was killed in March of 2004. Uh, his successor, Antisi, went into deep hiding and for several weeks. Uh, and then when he emerged at his family's house, I think it was the only time that he had popped his head up uh, uh, since the funeral for, uh, for Sheikh Yassin, uh, he too was uh, decapitated. But no one, you know the rest of the story. It did not catastrophically uh, crush the group, um, although it definitely did have uh, operational effects uh, on that organization. I think the best case scenario that you can hope for when it comes to deterrence and leadership decapitation is uh, what has happened with the men. So this is an organization, a terrorist group, that operates uh, in Nigeria. And it's an interesting organization because uh, it refuses to publicly name its leaders. And so every time they're in the news media, they have a spokesman and everyone is left wondering who is the, the leadership of this organization. So obviously it's difficult to quote unquote target the leaders in that situation, uh, but you can imagine the, the difficulties it is if you are uh, a member of the organization or a person joining the group, it's difficult to ascertain kind of, you know, if no one is in charge, maybe they know it internally, but uh, you, can, you can see that there might be some confusion uh, that's associated with that as well. That's kind of like, in my opinion, the best case where you're going to get deterrence. So 
taking stock of both the large end data uh, that I showed you earlier, as well as some of that anecdotal evidence, um, I would argue that leadership decapitation does not deter in the traditional sense. And so uh, I did not collude with my mentor and dissertation advisor, Martha Crenshaw, before saying that. And actually thinking of uh, your, your opening comment about uh, the RAND versus uh, Academy uh, Sciences, it's funny that Schelling's book was called Arms and Influence. Uh, so uh, very interesting. But I, I don't think it's deterred in the, in the traditional sense, meaning that if groups know that their leaders are going to be targeted by, uh, by the state, and let's be honest, there are no two better states that um, can, can do that than uh, Israel and the United States, and yet they still engage in terrorist activity thereafter, then deterrence by definition has already failed. Now, I am definitely not saying that we should, you know, we should not employ leadership decapitation uh, as a CT tool. I totally think we should. I think at the end of the day, the benefits outweigh the cons, but I just don't think that we should utilize deterrence as the logic for employing that, that, that tactic. Uh, relatively few of the groups actually catastrophically collapse immediately following leadership decapitation. My study found about less than 30. Other studies from Jenna Jordan and others were about 24%. So the argument that leadership decapitation deters future leaders from assuming command really doesn't hold. Um, now I'm sure people in this room are familiar with Jake Shapiro's uh, work on uh, bureaucracy and leadership, or I'm sorry, bureaucracy and uh, that kind of trade off between security and, and bureaucratic efficiency. And so one area that leadership decapitation does uh, have an influence, um, maybe not a deterrence, is in affecting the organization's operational capability. You can understand that because they know that uh, those leaders are gonna get targeted, uh, they will make the uh, proper uh, operational security uh, measures to protect those leaders. And that detracts from their ability to plan and plot and do those other things. Um, and so I, I definitely think that has uh, an oper operational uh, side effect, but not a deterrent one. And so I'll, I'll leave you with a, a provocative idea. Um, I was talking with uh, some folks yesterday and Maybe instead of saying, we should stop saying that leadership decapitation uh, is a deterrent to terrorist groups because if it doesn't deter, it kind of does a couple things. One, it doesn't deter them. Two, when it doesn't deter, it makes our CT efforts look bad and see it helps empower our enemies when if we're utilizing logic that's gonna deter them and then they attack thereafter, uh, I don't know. But in our, in our, in our, if you take a look at our national security documents, um, I joke that in order to get promoted to Fulberg Colonel, you have to come up with a D word in order to uh, justify your, your tactical terms. If you take a look at our documents, we love uh, defeat, deny, destroy, deter, disrupt, dismantle. Uh, I think removing the one of those D words will help uh, simplify what we're doing. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Let me, let me add another D, and this is debate. Um, Listening to you, uh, I really want to refer uh, one moment before we approach the next speaker, um, because uh, first of all, I would argue that there is a difference between the impact of decapitation on the existence of, uh, of the organization uh, and the dissolve of the organization for, uh, uh, after a certain period of time as you research that, and the question of uh, what is the immediate impact of the decapitation and I, I go back to uh, what Professor Schmidt uh, was uh, touching, and, and this is the concept of the boomerang effect. Uh, actually, the boomerang effect is the opposite of uh, uh, the deterrence effect that we are trying to achieve, because what you are doing by this or the other operation, it could be decapitation, it could be other airstrikes and, and other things, is you raise the motivation to retaliate, and, uh, and you might suffer from a boomerang effect. So boomerang effect is a proof of uh, the deficiency of, uh, of uh, uh, deterrence. In my PhD, many years ago, I interviewed almost all Israeli decision makers back then that had to do with uh, decapitation, starting with prime ministers, ministers of defense, uh, 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 chief of staff, uh, um, IDF uh, uh, chiefs, and, uh, and Mossad, and, and Shabak. And I asked them the, this question that is, is decapitation is an effective 
or ineffective, or actually the, the, the main question was, would you expect the boomerang effect as an outcome of interpretation or not? And you would not be surprised, you have two Israelis in one room, you have four opinions, uh, <laughs> that I got all sorts of answers that we could divide them into two groups. Those who said yes, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's effective, uh, I don't expect boomerang effect, and those who said it's counterproductive and there will be boomerang effect. But when you start to analyze that, you see that they gave you good, good examples, both, both groups. If you take, for example, the case of, uh, that you mentioned, Ahmed Yassin and later on Rantisi, they promised to set Israel on fire. Nothing happened as an outcome of this uh, uh, decapitation. Um, somebody killed uh, Patrish Kaki in Malta. Israel never took responsibility, but, uh, uh, but uh, um, the uh, uh, jihad, uh, Islamic Jihad uh, blamed Israel for that and promised to set Israel on fire. Nothing happened as an outcome of that. Uh, Imad Morania, um, Hezbollah went bananas as an outcome of that and, and, and promised that uh, there would be a huge retaliation. Well, it was not uh, real, uh, but you have other examples. You have Abbas Musawi in, uh, in, uh, in 92, which uh, immediately uh, uh, had the boomerang effect in Buenos Aires. And you had the case, uh, for example, of uh, the engineer, Ahmed Yassin, uh, excuse me, uh, um, uh, Ihya Yash, that, uh, that immediately thereafter, you had uh, Israel suffered from uh, three suicide attacks and another mass destruction attack. So who's right? And I was arguing in one of my, uh, my articles that you can not only say who is right, you can even predict if there will be retaliation or not be retaliation. This is based on one factor of the two factors that I mentioned in the formula of terrorism, motivation, the operational capability. The question is, what is the level of the operational capability of the terrorist organization at that time that you are launching uh, this uh, decapitation? Meaning, what is the limiting factor of the activity organization, of this organization? Is it that time before you attack the organization? The limiting factor is the motivation. He has more capabilities than, than he uh, actually uh, 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 used. I can, I can guarantee that if you will have decapitation, you will suffer from retaliation attacks. Vice versa, if he wants to attack more than he's capable before you launch the decapitation and you conduct the decapitation, there will not be a boomerang effect. There might be an attack down the road, but it would not be a boomerang outcome. So deterrence is, is, is really uh, uh, interesting when you compare that with the question of, of the boomerang effect. Um, now I'm, I'm privileged and happy actually to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Dimitri Dima Adamski. Uh, Dima is uh, maybe less known to the uh, community of uh, counterterrorism experts, but he's definitely known in the uh, community of security studies. Uh, Dima uh, is uh, a colleague of mine here at the uh, Laude School of Government, assistant professor, um, and um, he has been a pre and postdoctoral fellow at Harvard University a visiting fellow at the Institute of War and Peace uh, uh, Studies at Columbia University, and uh, the Norwegian Ist Institute for Defense Studies. In addition to his uh, academic career, Dr. Radamski has carried out intelligence analysis and strategic policy planning, both for the IDF uh, and through his uh, position uh, also in the Israeli uh, Ministry of Defense. Um, being a colleague of mine, working with him on a daily basis, I can tell you, uh, that he is a sea of knowledge and information and wisdom, and I'm sure you will enjoy his presentation. Please. I'm uh, trying my best to arrive through the 
conference, and it's actually the first time that I am here. It's also symbolic, and it's a privilege to be part of a major Ragunis uh, panel as someone who is serving on the committee for Ragunis Prize for the last five years, so in a way it's very uh, symbolic opportunity. Uh, I'd like to offer you, at the during the time that I have, a critical outlook on the theory and practice of deterrence as it is practiced in Israel, or as it is seen in Israel. Uh, what I'm going to say is basically based on uh, a research that I conducted for the IDF, uh, for the Israeli Defense Forces, and Ministry of Defense during the last couple of years, and also on their uh, article that is under review uh, of their uh, peer-reviewed academic journal right uh, now. In fact, um, Israeli strategic community and Israeli academic community have invested in the last 10 years very significant intellectual energy into the topic of deterrence for the very obvious and unfortunate reason that we were preoccupied in our everyday practice with this uh, issue. A lot of insights and ideas were generated during this effort and we're still in the process of learning and so far, and that's what I'm trying to do right now, um, I think we identified one very significant obstacle to the success of deterrence, and this is one of the three points that I'm going to address. And another two points out of three points in general that I'm going to talk about are going to be obstacles or problems that we face due to effectiveness of our deterrence. So one point will be about their obstacles to arrive to success, and another two points will be related to the issue of obstacles that we unfortunately experience due to our successful approach to deterrence. Um, I wasn't really planning to talk about it, but uh, uh, it's probably the virtue of being part of such a remarkable panel, listening to what Professor Jenkins said, and especially Professor Crenshaw in her introduction, I would like to make some introductory points they are more theoretical, just to situate what I'm going to say in the broader conceptual context. Uh, I'm inviting you to go back to the observations made by Professor Crenshaw when she said that judged by the standards of the canonical deterrent theory, what Israel is doing and calling deterrence is not really deterrence. It's much more corresponds with what canonical theory would call the strategy of control or the strategy of the use of brute force. I'm also referring you, and I can see the students are here in the audience, my students and Professor Bogdan's students and Professor Ganor students, we all assign work by Professor Crenshaw on her critique of cumulative deterrence. In one of her articles, she's giving examples of cumulative deterrence, as she did right now here, as an example of Israel being much more into the strategy of control and brute force rather than deterrence. I'm very much intellectually with you, but for the practical matter of this presentation and of the work that we are doing here, it's important for me to say that so far from the work that we have done in the community of scholars, it, al it is already obvious to us that different strategic communities conceptualize deterrence differently. People in the United States, people in Israel, people in Russia, people in China, people in Iran, people in the Arab world define deterrence even lexically, lexicographically in different terms and they inject different meanings into the same term. If you analyze even the root of the word in English, deterrent from the terror, in Hebrew it's arta'a, in Arabic it's rada, in Chinese and Mandarin it's veishi, in Russian it's zdirzhvanya, or ustrashenia, depending on what historical period I was looking to. In Farsi, in Iran, they call it bazdarandagi, and in Arabic it's called rada, by the way, the same root as in Hebrew. If we read what they are writing to themselves and saying to themselves about deterrence, it's pretty much different from canonical Western theory of deterrence that we are teaching our students and we are all scholars of. So it's just one caveat, a disclaimer that I would like to make before I start talking about Israel's work to deterrence. 
So by definition, what I'm presenting here is basically the way how Israelis, especially practitioners of Israeli strategic community, conceptualize the term. That's one. Number two, and that was an excellent point made by Professor Jenkins. When people talk about deterrence in Israel, the intellectual history of their thinking about it is primarily conventional, as opposed to the Western or the US deterrence strategy that was incepted in the nuclear context. Here, people develop the knowledge and the practice of deterrence as part of the conventional, conceptual, and empirical context. As we know, by the way, from the classical literature, primarily by Mersheimer and uh, Shimshoni and even Schelling, on the issue of conventional deterrence as opposed to nuclear deterrence, conventional deterrence by definition is contestable. In other words, in conventional deterrence as opposed to the nuclear deterrence, we do assume the use of limited force. Okay, so it's important to keep it in mind when we are thinking about Israeli force deterrence. Which brings me to, to the last point uh, Marta, that uh, I think coming from the same intellectual disposition as yourself, I think it's more precise if we're judging Israeli approach to deterrence to qualify it as intra-war coercion rather than deterrence. In general, when you listen to how Israelis talk about deterrence in Hebrew, they mix between the term of deterrent and compellence. I mean, the cold deterrence compellence and the other way around, different people, as Professor Ganor said, mean different things using the same terms. Different terms are used to refer to the same things. It's a big intellectual and conceptual mess in the best tradition of Israeli strategic culture. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's important to keep it in mind. By the way, uh, going back to your observation, as part of this research that I was doing with the Israeli practitioners <coughs> of deterrence, when I actually, I quoted them your work, trying to explain them that what you are doing, this is not exactly deterrence. This is much closer to brute force or to inter-war coercion. In the best case, they listened till the end, and then they told me politely that what I'm saying is basically casuistic academic nonsense that has nothing to do with the way how they do their business. That's what they call deterrence, and that's how we do deterrence. So what I'm going to present, and, and for me it's fine. I mean, as a scholar of strategic studies, I'm exploring this strategic community with the given strategic culture of this community, which is different from the strategic culture of your, strate of your strategic community or from the Russian strategic community or Chinese or Iranian. So what I'm trying to do right now when I'm talking about obstacles to deterrence and obstacles that effective deterrence produces in Israel, I'm basically judging Israelis by their own standards. So when I'm talking deterrence in, in, in my presentation, it's successes or failures, it's basically representing the way how Israeli practitioners are seeing it. Of course, I will add my own critical observations, but even the empirical representation is important. So this is just an introduction. All right, one, the first point of the three points that I would like to make. Um, The main obstacle to deterrence, to successful and effective deterrence in the Israeli practice of the last 10 years, um, I would qualify it as systematic crossing of what I call culminating point of deterrence. Let me explain. Israeli practitioners as practitioners around the world who are using violence in order to affect strategic behavior of the other side, whoever the other side is, whether it's a terrorist organization, hybrid entity, or something in between moving in the direction of this gray area that Professor Jenkins was talking about, we're using violence in order to maintain, restore, or establish norms of strategic behavior as far as this entity is concerned. It's a common denominator for us, for people coming from the United States, Europe, wherever. All of us practitioners of violence for the sake, organized violence for the sake of uh, political force, we are trying to find the golden range between undershooting and overshooting. We want to use force strong enough in order to affect strategic behavior of the other side, but we don't want to over escalate or uh, to use 
too much force in order to not to force the other side to do something that is running against our expectations. I'm taking the term from Karl von Clausewitz that was talking about the culminating point of attack or culminating point of victory, a point after which additional use of force is basically producing counterproductive outcomes. If you wish, you can compare it to their diminishing returns in uh, economics. Culminating point of deterrence, it's a point after which additional threat to use force, or that is a peacetime, or additional use of force, if it's a wartime, in fact produces undesired outcome. In the peacetime, it communicates to the other side that attack is inevitable, and instead of preventing the other side from doing something, it in fact instigates aggressive behavior. And during the war time, it's additional application of force that instead of de-escalating the dynamic between of us, is in fact contributing to escalation. Unfortunately, if you look into how Israel managed what it called deterrence operations of the last almost 10 years, starting from their um, second Lebanon war until now, most of the operations were qualified by the Israeli practitioners as deterrence operations. Unfortunately, almost in all of them, Israel crossed the culminating point of deterrence and used and applied more force than it needed. In fact, if you look into it, the most impressive operational outcomes of these campaigns, of these deterrence campaigns, were produced either in the first hours or in the first days of the campaign, after which we actually observed their diminishing returns as far as application of force is concerned. This is very unfortunate for uh, a lot of reasons, primarily for the reasons of the human life. It, it produces enormous amount of casualties and damage, undesired damage, and for moral and for pragmatic reasons of legitimacy that Professor Ganor outlined, Israeli strategies are looking for this culmination point of victory or culminating point of deterrence and don't want to cross it. By the way, it actually corresponds strongly with the point that Professor Ganor was outlining on his slide when you're trying to find the point that is the most optimal in your relations vis-a-vis -vis your enemy and the most optimal in your relations with the international community as far as the legitimacy is concerned. Why then Israel, Israeli practitioners, are behaving in a way that is self-defeating. Why Israeli approach to deterrence sometimes is so counterintuitive and counterproductive. Why do we cross the culminating point of deterrence? I can think of co influence I would like to offer as an uh, 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 argument influence of three different reasons for uh, why we cross the culminating point of deterrence. One is procedural, one is psychological, and one is political. First of all, as far as our procedure is concerned, um, and it again goes back to my uh, uh, point that I was making on uh, Professor Crenshaw's uh, observation. Um, Exactly like in the United States, uh, people in this country are in the process of learning with regards to deterrence. So if you look into the intellectual history of deterrence in this country, it's very dynamic. By the way, as in Russia right now, or as in Iran right now, people in Iran were introduced systematically to the concept of deterrence only in the last, uh, even less than 10 years. So you observe the way how they speak about deterrence and how they think about deterrence, what they read about deterrence, and I'm sure by the way that they are uh, viewing live this conference and this panel of deterrence, it is contributing to their process of learning. So we are also learning and we actually see a change of transformation in the way how people in this country thought about deterrence and did deterrence. Up to the 90s and 2000, uh, Israeli practice of deterrence was very intuitive, very impulsive. There was no speaking about their strategy of the idea of the prevention, which is actually their most advanced point of this learning process that was uh, available, that is available right now to us. 
So going to the 90s and to the 2000s, you observe incremental codification of methodologies how to do returns, speaking about intelligence diagnosis for the sake of returns, in other words, intelligence effort and um, in terms of collection and analysis for the sake of planning of deterrence operations. Then procedures that were oriented towards actual campaign design or operational planning for deterrence operation as opposed to classical military planning for the usual brute force, if you wish, operation. And finally, probably the most um, problematic point which strongly corresponds with the problem of deterrence theory is the establishment of effectiveness of deterrence, or what we call proving the causal link. It's very difficult for us, even historically, to prove that there is a causal link. Think about the Cold War, between particular acts of deterrence that we initiated, or signals that we initiated, and the response of the other side. As all of us know, the more we learn about the Cold War, the more we understand that most of our assumptions about deterrence were more in the realm of wishful thinking rather than a causal link. At the best, we observed their uh, correlation of events. But we convinced ourselves that it worked and we built the term theory. We built the term. In the practice of the last 10 years, uh, established rather systematic approach to intelligence that is supporting uh, deterrence, operational planning that is supporting deterrence. The weakest link is actually the third effort, which is uh, evaluating effectiveness of deterrence. We do not have a procedure that tells us where exactly should we stop. By the way, Clausewitz, when he was talking about the culminating point of victory, he said it's a point that it's very difficult to calculate uh, scientifically. His best uh, recommendation for a strategist in identifying the culminating point of attack was you should be a genius. If you are a military genius, you know where to stop. You know to identify and to fill this, um, this point. So of course it's a problem that is not only the problem of Israeli practitioners, it's a problem of every strategist around the world, but still we are trying our best to do it. As a rule, people are who are more successful than others in identifying these types of terms, of, of points, are people or communities that are practicing net assessment. Analytical technique that enables you to simulate your actions, the actions of your adversary, to forecast and foresee dynamic interaction between two of them, and then to identify second order consequences. It's still a very problematic analytical technique, but it enables you to do much better than all the alternatives. By the way, what Professor Jenkins did was he observed alternative strategic futures in terms of expansion of the nuclear club. That's exactly an example of this type of thinking. Historically, uh, Israeli strategic community is very, is very bad at doing net assessment. Operational net assessment in the sense of something that is taking place as we are waging this campaign and net assessment as part of strategic planning that is done in advance. So the procedural problem associated with crossing of the culminating point is our poor ability to conduct net assessment. That's one. Problem number two, or obstacle number two that accounts for uh, the reason why Israel crosses the culminating point of deterrence is psychological. If you remember Professor Ganor's slides, uh, one of the first slides of his presentation, he was talking about decisive victory. Israeli strategic community, starting from the late 90s, was at the crisis of knowledge and was experiencing paradigmatic change and shift as far as its ability to conduct decisive battle was concerned. Intellectual climate in the Israeli strategic community, starting from the late 90s, early 2000s, the working assumption was you are unable to achieve decisive victory on the battlefield. Uh, in terms of the terminology at their general staff back then, people were talking about decision substitutes or substitutes for decision, tahlifei akhra'a. Popularity of deterrence as a central concept of Israeli practitioners started exactly there. In fact, Israeli uh, fascination with the concept of deterrence among the rest is an outcome of Israeli inability or the feeling 
that was widespread in the Israeli strategic community starting from the late 90s in its inability to produce battlefield decision. Which means that right now when Israeli planners are planning deterrence operations, they do not aim to achieve a decisive victory on the battleground. From the start, if you are planning deterrence operation, you assume that your end state, the desired end state of your operation is limited. <coughs> and you start executing this operation. But then, if at the first stages of the operation you are experiencing operational success, then you have some sort of psychological feeling or psychological predisposition to develop this success further and maybe to take it to the classical decisive victory type of fighting. So in the way it's a psychological compensatorial inclination to go back to their, uh, or to compensate for their disappearance of battlefield decision from your professional practice. By the way, it's very problematical, just think about it. If you are uh, wearing a military uniform, your taxpayers are paying you money and you are telling them, I cannot provide you with battlefield decision. So what exactly are we paying our taxes for? So it's a very problematic social, uh, civil military relations situation and it's always at the back of practitioner's mind so psychological explanation, this inclination for a psychological compensatorial uh, effect might be another explanation. Finally, the third reason why we sometimes cross the culminating point of deterrence is political. Uh, civil military relations in the state of Israel work in a very unique and peculiar way, again going back to their idiosyncratic peculiarities of our strategic community, that political leadership, as a rule, is not providing a clear strategic guidance to military practitioners. So quite often, and we know it from the memoirs of the chiefs of the general staff or from the books written by Israeli journalists about recent campaigns, more often than not, IDF is starting its strategic planning and actually is waging wars without having a clear guidance from the political leadership with regards to the final strategic end state of the campaign. Moreover, quite often these end states or goals, they change throughout the campaign. You can start the campaign from one amorphic point or uh, observation made by the political leadership and provided to the military practitioners and then throughout the campaign, this political guidance transforms, which of course projects on the way how operation is planned and waged. And this is not the most optimal way of waging a military campaign, especially vis-a-vis -vis such a sophisticated adversary who realizes it and knows how to explain it. So the lack of the clear political guidance and also changes in strategic goals that we receive as practitioners of deterrence throughout the campaign also accounts for inability to pinpoint this culminating point of uh, deterrence. And again, it's not a problem that is pure problem of Israeli practitioners. Everyone around the world, your country included, uh, unfortunately, we are all forced to experience this quest after the culminating point of applying force. We do want not to overshoot and we don't want to undershoot, so it's a common denominator for all of us. I was just trying to present what are the unique obstacles that we are experiencing here. So this is my first point that relates to their main obstacle of deterrence practice in Israel. I have only five minutes left, so my last two points will be brief, laconic, and uh, also very sad. Um, I mean, sad, they're going to be paradoxical, not sad. Uh, I mean, they're intellectually fascinating, they're just very problematic as far as uh, the practice is concerned. Uh, 
um, effective deterrence stimulates military innovation on the other side. In a way, it even perpetuates ongoing fighting and makes it much more problematic for us. In other words, the more effective we are in applying deterrence strategy, the more sophisticated, complicated, and dangerous challenges we are about to face in the near and midterm future. Let me elaborate. It again builds on the point made by Professor Jenkins, Professor Schmidt, and Professor Crenshaw. And of course, it goes to their assumption that was presented by Professor Ganor in the beginning. Uh, deterrence, it's a strategy for preservation of the status quo. Compellence is a strategy for change of the status quo. It is something that is aimed against capabilities, means, and ways of the other side. It is not aiming against motivations or basic interests of the other side. So in case if you are successful, the best thing you can produce is probably to prevent particular type of violence. So you can prevent particular tactics or particular way of um, expressing strategic aggression against you. But it doesn't necessarily address the root concept. By the way, the concept of cumulative deterrence that was mentioned, at least in the way how Israelis see it, the basic assumption is that cumulative deterrence accumulation of tactical and operational successes can produce an effect on motivations and intentions of the other side. Those in Israel who believe that cumulative deterrence works, they always give an example of the peace treaty with Egypt. They give Egyptian example as an example of a country that experienced a repertoire of strategic losses on the battlefield vis-a-vis -vis Israel and convinced itself that probably it makes much more sense in terms of its relationship with the state of Israel to move into their peaceful uh, dynamic rather than to uh, promote violence. But again, going back to my initial point, as a rule, deterrence operation and deterrence strategy is aimed against tactic of the other side and not against its motivation. If we are successful, I'm sorry, I make one step uh, aside. In general, we in this country and everyone who is practicing deterrence vis-a-vis -vis one or more adversaries, we are in some sort of competition of learning. We are trying to outperform each other as far as our uh, way of waging war is concerned. Uh, Marta, you mentioned Thomas Schelling. Thomas Schelling has an excellent uh, term of designing around. Designing around, it's exactly the term that um, demonstrates the way how we are trying to outperform each other. Israeli experience with its adversaries in the last 30 years, it's an excellent story of competition of learning and designing around of the other side. By the way, we are a reactive part here, and by our reactions, we stimulate much more sophisticated military innovations of the other side. Let me illustrate it briefly. Up to the 1973, most of the Israeli campaigns that we were waging against our adversaries the main threat was conventional one. It took us about four decades to convince the other side that an effort to prevail, or as Professor Ganor mentioned, to defeat the state of Israel on the battlefield is doomed to fail. We showed it in 48, 56, 67, even 70, and 73. Eventually, it deterred most of our adversaries from challenging us on the conventional battlefield and force them to transform aggression to subconventional or non-conventional battlefields. So we deterred them from attacking us conventionally because here we produced an unprecedented and unquestionable competitive advantage. And this is why we observed a raise and uh, diffusion of terrorism, especially of suicide terrorism in the 90s and in the 2000s. So we started to look for the countermeasure against suicide terrorism and terrorism. When suicide terrorism was addressed in an effective way, 
it transformed aggression to ballistic realm. So we observed mukawama of what we call suicide bombers. Right now, we are observing ballistic mukawama. We produced, as Professor Ganor mentioned, a countermeasure, which seems to be very effective against ballistic mukawama, active defense iron dome capabilities. And already during the last campaign and also following the last campaign, we observed how the other side is designing around into the underground realm. People in this country are also very sophisticated, so I tend to believe that we will find the countermeasure against uh, underground warfare. It will probably force the other side to move into something much more sophisticated. So my point is that it's a dialectical action-reaction co strategic competition. It's a competition of learning, and the more sophisticated response we are producing, the more sophisticated innovation we are about to uh, face. And if you think about historically and retrospectively, each and every round of sophistication or of innovation of the other side is much more dangerous to the state of Israel. So my point here is that effective deterrence can stimulate very sophisticated, effective, and dangerous military innovation. Yes, and in the last minute that I have, an outcome of um, successful deterrence that produces a political paradox. Effective deterrence can perpetuate and prolong a conflict with the other side. Why? Because deterrence, it's a tool for maintaining status quo or for managing your conflict with the other side. It's not a tool of conflict resolution. So the more effective Israeli strategic community is in providing its decision makers with strategic calm and quiet, the less incentives Israeli decision makers and politicians have for addressing the root causes of the problem. I'm not saying whether it's good or bad, I'm just saying that effective deterrence is um, uh, inclining decision makers to conflict management rather than conflict resolution and often can turn into the channel of escapism for whatever reason, strategic or political, from addressing the root causes of their uh, conflict. Thank you very much again, Professor Ganor, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Dima. You know that I could uh, sit here and listen another three hours to you. Uh, I thought that you're finishing your lecture on, only after the introductory uh, remarks, but uh, it was fascinating. So thank you for this brilliant talk. Uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, the last speaker of the panel before we approach uh, Professor Murari to be the responder for, for this talk. Um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, uh, Kent uh, Solheim. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Solheim is uh, currently serving as the U.S. Uh, uh, ASOC. How do you pronounce that? ASOC? Uh, Special Operations. Special Operations, okay. Uh, fellow at the Combat uh, Terrorism Center at the United States Military Academy at the West Point. I won't go over all the credentials of uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Solheim, but I would say that he uh, has advised and worked with uh, various host nations, including the Iraqi Counterterrorism Forces, the Afghan National Army, the Afghan National Army Special Operation Command, and many others. The floor is yours. Good morning. Sir, that's a tough act to follow. Um, so, uh, sir, thank you for uh, this opportunity. Um, this is uh, a couple firsts for me. This is the first time that I've been in Israel and the first time here. So uh, I've been nothing but impressed with both the country and, and this conference. And <laughs> I love the weather. It's just like home. Uh, I can't see very far. I feel like I'm in New York City. But, uh, and it's also a, another first 
Um, I think it's the first time that my hair has ever been introduced at a conference, so I'd like to thank <laughs> Lieutenant Colonel Price for that, uh, those kind remarks. Um, so when I received the invitation to come here, uh, I looked at the panel members and uh, I thought to myself, this was a little bit like a high school band opening for the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and if there's any question, I am the high school band and this was uh, the Rolling Stones. But nonetheless, I hope that what I have to add this morning will, uh, will, will contribute to the overall panel. Um, so like, like Brian, I'm gonna focus a little bit on a tool today. And uh, it's, it's a unique tool in that I think it's difficult to assess whether or not um, it's actually working when we're talking about the realms of deterrence, uh, but we'll discuss it nonetheless. Um, so to start out, I'll talk a little bit about how this tool building partner capacity, and I'll say from this point forward, instead of me repeating building partner capacity over, over and over again, I'll just say BPC. But when we're using um, BP, BPC as a tool, I want to reflect a little bit on how it's been used in the last decade. Um, it's certainly not going to help my argument. But, uh, you know, March of this year, we saw uh, U.S. forces leave Yemen um, as Houthi rebels uh, were very close to the American base where U.S. special forces and other forces were that for over a decade have been working with Yemeni counterterrorism forces. And of course, as you all know, we've left that country. Um, so I would say that that's a check mark in the lose column for BPC. Um, and when we talk about BPC, what I'll say on steroids, uh, we look at Iraq and we've talked a lot about the Islamic State and we've talked about the hollow response of Iraqi forces against the Islamic State. Um, and obviously we've invested a lot of treasure into uh, building that force. I will put that as a check mark in the lose column for BPC. And the, um, the resiliency of the Afghan force that we've built is uh, I think only really truly being tested now as, as coalition forces back off and they assume the responsibility. So the verdict's out on, uh, on how well this tool works in Afghanistan. Nonetheless, I'll defend this, this argument. Um, so this morning I'm going to talk very briefly about what building partner capacity is and how uh, I think it can be used in terms of deterring terrorism. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about when uh, I think it's a good tool to use and then um, to try to end up on a, on a happy note because yes, sir, this, I was sad after your last two points. We'll try to show something perhaps uh, I'll, I'll finish off where maybe BPC has been a, an effectively used tool. So, uh, and I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence with this up here, but I just simply want to frame what building partner capacity is. And if you see the chart behind me uh, running from south to north, um, I've got the destabilizing effects in the south and on the north side of this chart, uh, stabilizing effects, and then in the left or west, unilateral operations. And then very importantly for this discussion is the partner is the main effort um, when we look on the right side of this chart. So in that upper right quadrant, um, I've listed some missions that fall under responsibilities of United States Special Operations Forces. Um, keep in mind this is not strictly a special operations mission for, uh, for Americans, uh, service members, however, um, it is eight of the 12 core tasks of uh, special operations. So we really, we really own this mission. Um, but uh, underneath building partner capacity, you have foreign internal defense, you have security force assistance, you have countering both terrorism and insurgency. You have direct action. And then uh, if you go to the destabilizing effects, you have uh, unconventional warfare, which um, is defined as activities conducted to enable a resistance movement or insurgency to coerce, disrupt, or overthrow a government or occupying force. So um, when we talk about building partner capacity, um, we're talking really ab about local partners, and that's very key to this discussion, is through local partners that stabilize, uh, act to stabilize or destabilize. Um, we maintain a very small footprint in these operations, we being, I'm talking about my own government, US government and government forces. Uh, it's typically long in duration. We don't measure this type of operation in uh, a year or two. We measure it really in decade, decade plus. Um, we employ uh, t political warfare in this and it certainly requires interagency operations. And, and I'm, because we're talking specifically about military, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on the security side of this, but understand that this is a whole government approach that for our government includes Department of State, USAID, CIA, 
DOD, it's definitely everybody that's involved in an operation like this. Um, I think it's also important to note, you hear a term um, train and equip, train and equip, train and equip. Um, training and equipping forces to me means that you simply have a force that shoots better with better equipment, but that's not really what we're looking at doing here. Um, we're really looking at uh, the monopoly of force that's working for a legitimate government. So uh, I'm talking about this in terms of deterrence, um, and I think uh, Professor Crenshaw outlined this early on. Um, this is not deterrence in a traditional sense, but I would classify it as deterrence by denial. And if we're looking at the tactical level when we use this tool overseas, we're, we're, uh, we're talking about um, creating space between the terrorist and his victim. If we look at it at the operational level, we're uh, looking at removing sanctuary for our adversaries, and I think we're contributing in part um, to the uh, to reducing the sources of instability that we know are uh, are really incubators for terrorism. So, building partner capacity is definitely not the toolbox. Is anyone, uh, there's, there's a lot of takeaways, obviously, from this conference for me, but I think um, it's highlighted that when you choose to attack this problem, it's a multi-pronged approach. There's no silver bullet. This is not a panacea, but this is just simply another tool. And I'll only focus on a couple bullets on this screen uh, due to the time constraints that we have, but I think it's important to realize this is a force multiplier. Um, and I really like the last bullet on here for, uh, from a practitioner perspective where I'm keeping it simple and stupid. Um, I'm trying to work my way out of a job when I go work with a partner force. Um, so this is for coming from a democracy that doesn't have a lot of patience, doesn't really like to invest a lot of, of treasure over time, um, and I would argue some, somewhat short-sighted in, in some of the things that we do. Um, this is a very fiscally and politically sustainable option for us. So, we'll get to why I think building partner capacity is a very smart tool. Um, it, it is a smart tool when, uh, when the interests, of, in this case, of the U.S. government and those we partnered with are aligned, uh, both politically and with regards to our security interests. Um, more is better in both of those cases. Uh, building partner capacity is a very smart tool when we're working with a sovereign nation and we're not always going to have that benefit. However, if this is a whole of government approach, uh, building partner cap capacity is a very complex task. It's transforming a security sector into professional, effective, legitimate, apolitical, and accountable sector that supports the rule of law. And I think that's really key when you think about that and going back to my, my statement earlier of training and equipping, this is far more complex than that. Building partner capacity is a smart tool. Uh, when legitim legitimacy of a host nation and security force is important. Um, yesterday, Mr. Braniff, if you were here on the panel, talked about, uh, on the Global Jihad panel, talked about sort of the brush fires that Al-Qaeda and ISIL, ISIS is creating across the globe. And realistically, we cannot address all of those things. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources, and, and certainly I don't think we're going to get support at home for that. Um, so this... Uh, when we can't take a unilateral approach, it's very important that we have a tool like this that allows a, a multinational attack on this problem. And uh, this certainly falls within that sector. And then finally, uh, building partner capacity has to have a mill pulse st strategy, military political strategy, campaign plan. Um, and, you know, that's very important, obviously, because we're going to avoid political fratricide. All right, so I'm going to end on a positive note. Uh, I'm going to use a, an example of where building partner capacity has been very effective. Uh, I started out with three bad examples, and I'll end on a, on a positive note. But I'm going to reflect a little bit on, on Columbia. Um, and as you can see up here, I've got some of the elements of national power and some of the things that we've invested into this country. But I want to go back in time to 1998-ish in Columbia when um, essentially that government was a failed state. Um, about 20% of the, muni the municipalities of that country were not reached by the federal government. Um, you had the FARC and the ELN, 
um, which were serious problems at that time. And uh, if you were to characterize, again talking about security forces, if you were to characterize the Colombian military at that time, it was a garrison unit unable to do offensive operations effectively and certainly not counterinsurgency. We'll fast forward now after 9-11 um, when, uh, and, and I didn't even address the, the narco-terrorism that was going on, but post 9-11 that clearly became um, a policy of the United States. Um, but time now, after uh, we put 120 uh, special operations service members on the ground um, to work with the uh, Colombian security forces, they now have an operational and uh, tactical special operations capability. Uh, the equivalent of our Special Operations Command now exists in Colombia. Um, that military force uh, is capable of doing, capable of doing joint operations, um, and it is certainly contributing to regional stability even outside of its own borders. Um, so it is a success story, and we can see um, that this tool can be effective if applied correctly. And I don't want to say that building partner capacity was the was the key event in, uh, in Colombia. I'm certainly not implying that. There was Plan Colombia and, and there was a lot of things going on and, and we were just a, a part of that happening, but I think we're a, a fair share of that when we start talking about um, security forces. So um, these are the conclusions. Essentially, I really think this is uh, something that we need to consider. Uh, it is a deterrent, but it's a deterrent in sort of a unique and newly defined way. Um, but uh, it's one that I think will suffice given a lot of the other constraints that we've discussed. So look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. And uh, actually, uh, now we concluded the uh, opening part of, uh, of this workshop. Uh, as you can presume, we have uh, two more days to discuss that. No, I'm just kidding. Um, we, uh, we we directly uh, approach to the responding, and I've asked uh, Professor Ariel Merari uh, to be the responder. The reason I asked Professor Merari to be the responder because uh, he has done a lot of research uh, in the field of counterterrorism in general, in the in, in the uh, uh, niche of deterrence as well. Still working on that uh, on that field, uh, Professor Merari is really uh, one of the world leaders. Uh, on counterterrorism, uh, and I have uh, a, a huge obligation and, and uh, 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 admiration uh, to uh, Professor Marari being my mentor uh, for so many years. When I was uh, uh, founding this institute with my friend and colleagues, uh, the model that I had in my mind is to be as close as possible to what Ariel already has achieved, uh, Professor Marari. Uh, at that particular period of time. So, Ariel, thank you for everything you are doing. Thank you for who, who you are uh, and uh, being my mentor. And uh, thank you for agreeing to respond uh, to the panel. Well, thank you very much, Boz. <coughs> for your uh, extremely kind words. And actually, uh, I was surprised by uh, Boaz's uh, uh, suggestion that I'd uh, uh, respond to uh, what we just heard in this uh, wonderful panel. But uh, before that, I must say uh, um, that I've been doing, uh, Boaz gave me a great compliment in describing my work on terrorism. I, I must say in, in this, uh, regard that uh, um, looking back at my work uh, on terrorism during more than 30 years, almost 40 years, I suppose, um, I must come to the conclusion that my greatest contribution to the field uh, has been uh, having Boaz as my assistant and uh, <laughs> student. <laughs> No doubt uh, this was uh, the greatest contribution. Um, and uh, anyway, I'm uh, honored to be, to participate in this uh, particular session on deterrence in uh, memory of Eyal uh, uh, Ragunis, my family was here. And um, um, 
This has been a wonderful panel, really. Very diverse, very interesting. Uh, many ideas uh, uh, from uh, very different angles that uh, make, all this makes it uh, very hard to uh, kind of summarize it or to, to respond to, uh, to particular, the plethora of particular ideas that have been uh, suggested here. Um, anyway, I'd like to, to uh, try to, uh, uh, in a few minutes, uh, um, point out what I think are the most important aspects that uh, um, have been raised here concerning uh, terrorism deterrence, deterrence of terrorism, that is. Um, and um, just say what, what should, in my view, be the framework for approaching uh, this whole area of uh, deterring terrorism. In the case of deterring terrorism, the situation in a great difference from, in a marked difference from interstate nuclear deterrence in the case of deterring terrorism, the, the, the situation uh, involves a plethora of actors, varying degrees of violence, different types of threats and responses over a long period of time. It is a dynamic rather than stable situation, dynamic rather than a stable problem. Uh, deterrence theory, um, in, a, in any orderly way, started uh, in the 1950s, 1960s, against the backdrop of uh, um, a nuclear uh, threat, interstate nuclear deterrence. That was actually the, uh, the, the, the point of departure for deterren deterrence uh, research, deterrence theory. Uh, conventional deterrence is uh, more complex, more uh, difficult to handle than uh, interstate nuclear deterrence. Interstate nuclear deterrence is very simple. It's an all or none uh, matter. It's a zero sum game. It is even, you have to maintain deterrence, but deterrence is stable. That this situation that you are maintaining is stable. Um, terrorism is, terrorism is the, the, the terrorism environment is terribly different, very, very different. Um, it, it's different in all these aspects that I just mentioned. And therefore, I, I, uh, uh, I very much uh, like what uh, Boaz said uh, that we, in, in his introductory remarks, uh, that we need different types of deterrence from, for different situations when it comes to uh, uh, coping with terrorism. Actually, we need theories of deterring terrorism rather than one uh, theory of uh, deterring terrorism. Brian have, has been uh, speaking here and in his, uh, Brian wrote about deterring nuclear terrorism in the 1970s. Many people forget it today. <coughs> People kind of reinvent uh, theories of, uh, of uh, coping with terrorism, and they write what, uh, what Brian and Martha uh, and Alex too wrote uh, decades ago. Brian talked about uh, deterring terrorism uh, in the 1970s and his re in his recent book again. And deterring nuclear terrorism is a very different issue than uh, deterring uh, the individual terrorist, the lone wolf. Very different matter. It is even different uh, from uh, deterring Hamas and Hezbollah in a situation uh, that <coughs> we in Israel have been uh, facing uh, over the last uh, uh, two or three decades. Very different. These are different issues. But I think in coming to, to put some sense into this 
um, complex, very complex problem. We have to, rem to, uh, to uh, uh, remember, I think, several points. And I'd like to suggest three points here that uh, uh, kind of characterize deterring terrorism. The first point is that deterring terrorism is relative. It's not an all or none matter. It's not a zero sum game. It is relative in several senses, in several meanings. One thing is that at the, at the individual level, and there are three, at least three levels of deterring terrorism. Individual level, deterring the individual terrorist or terrorists or those terrorists that Alex Schmidt has been uh, talking about prevention. You, know, you, you want people not to radicalize. He, he was talking about individuals. There are groups that you want to deter and there are states state sponsors of terrorism. There are three, at least three levels. At the individual level, deterrence is a relative, must be a relative concept. You cannot deter each and every, every uh, potential terrorist. Clearly. One thing is that uh, it has to do with the question of, uh, of uh, rationality. Some people are willing to commit suicide. But how many? What proportion of the people uh, that uh, believe that, uh, that, let's take uh, uh, Islamic uh, radicals. You know, there are many, many Muslims around the world, more than a billion, and almost all of them, presumably, believe in paradise, and they believe that Shahids go straight to paradise, and they believe that if you are a martyr, a Shahid, you would go straight to paradise. But what proportion of them are willing actually to carry out a suicide attack so as to get immediately to paradise right now? A very, very, very small percentage, extremely small per percentage, about 4,000 suicide attacks around the globe have been registered since, I think, 19, uh, the 1980s. 4,000. You cannot deter all potential terrorists, but you can deter many. You can deter most of them, presumably. We don't have the time now to go into the question of uh, you know, their, 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 their criminology. Uh, there have been studies about uh, the effectiveness of punishment um, on uh, the inclination or the willingness to carry out uh, uh, criminal acts. Basically, the chance of being caught, the severity of punishment, and the immediacy of punishment are the three factors that determine whether a person would be willing to carry out uh, a, uh, a criminal act, if he was essentially inclined to do that. This is true concerning terrorists, just that it is relative. Some people are deterred by, by a certain level of punishment, while others need a higher level, and still others won't be deterred, they are willing to die. By the way, even that, you know, if people who are willing to die, not necessarily are willing to, to uh, put at risk their family's home, for instance. In Israel, we did, I can tell you about, about it in great detail on another occasion. We have carried out a large study of suicide uh, bombers here in Israel. What they are mo those who are who are about to carry out a suicide attack are worried about their, uh, their, uh, the fate of their family after their death. That's a fact. So terrorism is relative. We have to remember it. Deter no, no terrorism is relative. Deterrence is relative when you talk about terrorists at the individual level. Second, 
there is another perhaps pers perspective or aspect of relativity here. There is partial deterrence when you come to talk about terrorism. A concept that cannot, I, I would say by definition, exist, partial deterrence, cannot exist in the case of interstate nuclear deterrence. You cannot bomb just Washington, uh, DC, uh, uh, and, uh, and hope the Americans uh, would take it. Um, it's not so bad. You just bomb, uh, you, uh, you nuked Washington, DC. That doesn't work. It's either, uh, Either, or, uh, either yes or no, all or, all or none game. Now, in the case of terrorism, there is partial deterrence. There are sometimes red lines. Take, for instance, Israel's agreement, unspoken agreement with terrorist organizations all along its history, including Hamas right now. It works two ways with Hezbollah, for instance, for a long time. We had an agreement. We don't do certain things to Hamas. We don't uh, 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 bomb the hell out of them as we could do. And Hamas does not, does not uh, carry attacks against us. For a long period of time, there was an agreement. You can attack soldiers. You cannot attack civilians, for instance. Kind of red lines. You can do this, you cannot do that. We won't tolerate it. That's partial deterrence, which does exist in the case of uh, uh, coping with terrorism, but not in the case of, uh, uh, not even in the case of conventional war. The third thing which characterizes uh, uh, deterring uh, terrorism is the cumulative deterrence aspect, which Marta and uh, I think Alex too, uh, I don't remember, I think Alex and Marta did not accept it uh, or think that it is not uh, um, a uh, valid, uh, valid aspect. It is, I think. By the way, the, the, uh, uh, just uh, <laughs> for the sake of, uh, of credit, uh, historical credit, I think as much as I know, the uh, idea of uh, cumulative deterrence has been first offered by Doron Almog, uh, a, uh, an ex-major uh, uh, general who, uh, in, in the IDF who uh, wrote his uh, master's degree uh, uh, on deterrence. And I think he, he was the first to introduce the, the idea of uh, cumulative deterrence. Uh, at first, I, I didn't like it. But uh, over, over time, uh, I came to realize that this is actually what happens in many cases in the terrorism, deterring terrorism situation. Take, for instance, the situation of uh, the first and the second intifadas. The first intifada started in 1987, December 1987. It died out in about 1992, you can't even pinpoint exactly where it, it stopped. 1992, 1993. By 1993, it was over. It died out. Why? The second intifada started in this September 2000, kind of died out. I, I'd say perhaps a point of, uh, you can, you can, uh, you can put your finger on uh, was the death of Yasser Arafat, which wasn't uh, an act that uh, we can uh, take credit for. It was not. Uh, November 11, uh, 2004. Um, it, again, it kind of died out. Why? Why did it die out? Because Palestinian society one became tired of the hopeless, their hopeless effort. They lost, lost hope. The hopeless effort to gain some political success out of uh, political gains out of uh, this great, great 
uh, uprising that they, that they suffered so much for. Palestinian society suffered immensely, socially, economically. Okay? It, in a way, it was deterrence by denial. But it took them time to internalize, to understand that it is hopeless. This, this because deterring terrorism is a process. It is not a one point thing. It is a very differ different psychological and social phenomenon than the kind of military deterrence situation that, that we are used to talk about uh, when we are uh, dealing with uh, nuclear interstate deterrence. You are talking here about the willpower, the political will, the will of the people of two populations, the Israeli population, how much it, it, is, it can take, how much it is committed, and the Palestinian situation, Palestinian population, I'm sorry, how much it, they can take, what is their, what is the current level of suffering that they are, that you can say they are now at, at the, what level of, of uh, suffering they, they are now uh, uh, at, compared to the top, to, 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 to the ceiling that, that they, they, are, they, they won't take more than that. So it's a relative, uh, power, staying power of societies involved. This is what influences in the long run. Terrorist campaigns, terrorist struggles. So I think that uh, this is cumulative deterrence. It takes time to, un to, to, to understand that the situation is hopeless and it takes time for the uh, cup of uh, misery, of suffering, to fill. These are the three, perhaps, main, in my view, main differences, main characteristics uh, 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 of uh, uh, deterring terrorism that, are, that makes it different than uh, other uh, other forms of deter, other situations of deter. I just want to, one, one more last thing, small thing in, uh, uh, that uh, uh, came to my mind uh, listening to uh, uh, Dima Adamski's uh, interesting, uh, very interesting presentation. Um, well, the point, uh, the interesting point about uh, the, um, um, I think, um, diminishing returns. The point of, the point of that's, that's a very interesting point, one very interesting point. Uh, how hard do you want to, to, to hit the, 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 the adversary? so as to create deterrence. Uh, there was a, a kind of similar no, situation. Uh, are any of you familiar with the uh, USSBS, United States Strategic Bombing Survey? Yeah. Some are, good, great. Uh, not many people usually are, I think. In the Second World War, the United States carried out uh, carpet bombing. Very massive uh, bombing of uh, Japan and Germany and so on. Um, you probably uh, remember the uh, bombing of Dresden, the bombing of Hamburg, uh, bombing of bombings of Berlin and so on. <coughs> Americans are very uh, uh, systematic people. 
and uh, it was very important for them to uh, uh, learn how effective were these bombings, because it was a huge investment. Thousands of airplanes, uh, thousands of tons of, uh, of bombs, lives of uh, pilots lost, let alone the targeted people. So they set up the United States Strategic uh, Bombing Survey. They created teams, psychologists, area specialists. And these, they, they uh, devised questionnaires. And these teams went with the front forces. And when, when the uh, American forces uh, occupied the German town, immediately a bunch of psychologists and uh, German-speaking uh, intelligence officers, uh, ethnologists, uh, uh, came uh, to interview uh, the uh, citizens. Uh, questions were, uh, uh, well, how, how, do you how, how did you feel uh, when, uh, when uh, your city was bombed? Terribly, <coughs> not so bad. I was happy, just marked it. <coughs> the bottom line was, of course, the American uh, wish to, uh, intention to, to measure the effect of uh, bombing on morale, on ge German uh, population's morale. Um, how depressed were they? The findings were very interesting. Findings were that the most effective um, bombings in terms of, uh, of lowering German morale was medium heavy bombing, not the most heavy, not the heaviest bombings, heaviest bombing.